tonight. Uh, thank you for joining our event. We're honored tonight to be joined by Thomas Frank. He's a writer. He's an author of uh, best-selling books, including What's the Matter with Kansas, Listen Liberal, and his latest book is called The People Know, A Brief History of, of Anti-Populism. So we're really excited and grateful to be joined by Thomas Frank. We have a lot of exciting topics to be talking about uh, briefly for the format of tonight. Uh, I'll be co-moderating the event tonight. My name is Amar Ahmed. I am a co-chair of Mass Peace Action's Legislative Political Committee, uh, which is a sponsor of this event. Uh, our organizer, Brian Garvey, he's also going to be co-moderating our event tonight. We'll be having some uh, prepared questions from Mass Peace Action members. And uh, towards the end of the event, we'll be opening it up for audience Q&A. So if you have any interesting uh, questions you'd like to ask, make a note of them and you will get your chance uh, tonight. So on that note, uh, let's get started. So um, Thomas Frank, uh, one of my personal favorites of his is uh, Listen Liberal. And uh, if you notice the title of the book is Listen Liberal or What Ever Happened to the Party of the People. So to get started tonight, uh, Thomas Frank, can you tell us uh, what Whatever happened to the party of the people? <laughs> Good question, Amar. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you for having me and for starting us off. So uh, with with that uh, with that, I actually have a copy of it right here myself. Uh, I was because um, it's been a while since I wrote this, so I had to remind myself of what what it was about. But uh, it's the story of of how the Democratic Party went wrong and uh, how they lost their way. Although they don't think they've lost their way they think they've you know got everything figured out and uh uh you know and, and there's just you know impediments here and there that they have to overcome but it's basically how the democratic party uh stopped worrying about inequality and became it stopped being a party of working class people and became something very different um the sort of uh, party that we that we all know today that is obsessed with the sort of tastes and values of affluent um, white collar suburban professionals. You guys are there in Massachusetts, and there's a whole there's a, a, a whole chapter of the book about my sort of um, I wrote I, I spent a lot of time in Boston when I was writing the book. I, I sort of uh, lived there for a while, and. Um, a lot of the book is about the sort of cult of innovation that you see in uh, in Boston and in the state of Massachusetts generally, which I understood to be, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of pure example of what, uh, you know, the Democratic Party, uh, their, their sort of philosophy of ruling when they have are, you know, completely have a free hand to do whatever they want. This is what it looks like. Uh, and it's a paradise for, you know, like big pharma. And you know various companies on Route 128 and stuff like that, where it looks really, really different, <laughs> is in Fall River, and uh, places like Fall River and Springfield and Western Massachusetts, which are just left behind, and there's no plan for, there's no conceivable way in which these places will recover uh, in in this sort of uh, uh, liberal utopia as imagined by our modern day Democratic Party. So the long story short, it's this, it, it, this is the story of how the Democratic Party became the second party of the rich. You know, the Republicans, as we all know, uh, are, you know, the party of the top 1% or maybe even of the top 0.1%. Uh, and they very ably represent certain industries and certain varieties of very, very wealthy people. You know, remember the Koch brothers from Wichita, Kansas, uh, oil money generally, you know the story of the Republican party, defense contractors, that kind of thing. But the Democrats have become a party that is, uh, that is also very, very uh, concerned with the fortunes of the very rich. I, I call them the, uh, the party of the 10%, the top 10%, because that's sort of the, you know, that's the, um, that's the position of sort of affluent um, white collar people with advanced degrees, by the way, which Massachusetts has and Boston specifically has in great abundance. And, uh, uh, you know, if you ever look at maps of uh, 
I mean, we all we all know this happening. We can all see it all around us, as the Republican Party has sort of sharpened its outreach to uh, white working class people. This is the you know the what's the matter with Kansas phenomenon. As they have done that, the Democrats have have sort of reimagined themselves as a party of. Um, of, of science and professional orthodoxy. And so you see things like the state of Missouri. I was in Missouri for when the election, when the 2016 election happened and it, <laughs> I'll never get those maps out of my head. When I was a child, Missouri was a very democratic state. This is Harry Truman's home state. Um, you know, Kansas City is very, very democratic place. Uh, and uh, now the Democrats only carried St. Louis, Kansas City and the county where the uh, University of Missouri is located. And that's the same everywhere you go, basically, outside of you know, a handful of, of, of states. And the Democrats, by and large, are, are, are happy with that, with that state of affairs. And uh, they don't mind being the, uh, you know, a party of, you know, they're the party of one elite and the Republicans are a party of a different elite. And they are absolutely content with that. Uh, they, you know, I've been writing about this for some time and I'm here to tell you they have no, uh, there's no real strategy for making them change their ways. Uh, they're not interested in changing their ways. Anyhow, that's what Listen Liberal was about. But these days, <laughs> that came, book came out in 2016. Actually, it came out well before the election. I had no idea that Donald Trump was going to be the Republican candidate for president when I was writing it. And it was a, kind of a shocker when he went out on the campaign trail and seemed to echo themes from the book. That was very surprising to me. Uh, but these days, I'm writing about, the, I'm talking about uh, something different. Populism. The people. No. Shall I go into this, Amar? Or how do you want to play it? How do you want to do it? Yeah, go, go ahead. OK, go so ahead. populism. Uh, I might have, you guys might know that I come from Kansas, which, uh, by the way, did you know? No one knows this. Kansas was a colony of Massachusetts in its early days. It was, uh, uh, it was settled. Yeah, it was settled by. Um, by abolitionists who were sent out by the uh, what was it called the um, uh, Massachusetts something something society I, I forget what the name of it was but they they went to Lawrence Kansas and a, and a number of other cities the idea was to block well, yeah it was Kansas, yeah. Kansas it was to block the expansion of this what they called the slave power by force of arms you know <laughs> they were going to literally get in their way <laughs> and that was. Yeah, I think it was called the. Um, uh, oh, I don't remember what the what the what the organization was called, but they sent people to uh, to Kansas for that purpose, and that's how the state wound up getting founded. Yeah, and John Brown was one of those people, and uh, and uh, they uh, armed themselves, and uh, and things got a little crazy. Anyhow, that's a uh, so. But those are those links are are long forgotten. Uh, you know, there's the the sort of the the the. The uh, Puritan um, ethic survives to some degree in Kansas. It's the last state that, when I was a kid, they still basically had um, prohibition there. <laughs> but the uh, one of the few things that uh, that Kansas is it, it can be legitimately proud of and famous for is that this is the place where the word populism was invented. Uh, it was invented in the year 1891 by a bunch of guys riding on the train between Kansas City and Topeka, and they came up with the word in order to describe followers of a brand new third party movement that had just swept uh, uh, state elections in Kansas. The formal name of the party was the People's Party, but they uh, it, it, over the year they they said, well, we'll call the the people who are. Um, who support this party, we'll call them populists. This is just, they made the word up uh, using the Latin word for people, populus. And uh, it caught on. And before very long, that was all anybody called it. People you know, who voted for the populists didn't even know that the party had a different formal name. That's just what they thought it was called, the populist party. It was the last great third party movement in American history. It was a, uh, 
I'm often surprised at, uh, that this is that that what I'm about to tell you is not is unknown to a lot. Of, a lot of Americans don't know it, um, but this is you know we learned all this stuff in elementary school in Kansas. <laughs> but it was a it was a left wing third party. The word did not mean proto fascist or Donald Trump or anything like that. What the populists were was a movement of farmers and industrial workers. So there was a huge farmers union in those days, enormous millions and millions and millions of members. Uh, and uh, uh, they wanted uh, basically government programs for farmers. Uh, uh, they wanted uh, the government to take over the railroads because railroads are a natural monopoly and farmers were sort of uniquely in the grip of, of railroads. They wanted to take the US off the gold standard uh, and replace it with what, what they called fiat currency or the silver, a silver standard is a kind of halfway point along that. And a bunch of other things. They wanted to, uh, they wanted to fix the electoral system. So they wanted votes for women. They wanted the secret ballot. They wanted um, uh, the direct election of US senators. And they got all those things. In fact, they got everything that I just mentioned. It took years, but they eventually got all of those things. And, uh, but the, the movement itself didn't last long, uh, lasted about six or seven years, uh, and then sort of disappeared. And, uh, uh, well, where should I go from there? Should I tell the story of populism, what happened to them? Because it's absolutely fascinating. Or should I tell you the story of how the word, how the meaning of the word changed? Because it has, it had nothing to do with, uh, uh, you know, the way we use the word today is to, to mean like a racist demagogue or would be dictator or anything like that. These people were as far away from that as you could be in the 1890s. They were, well, they were people like us. They were, they were the good guys at the time. Uh, and the, but the word has evolved over the years in this really peculiar way to the point where now people write histories of the 1890s and try to understand understand the populists as these kind of proto Donald Trumps, which they they weren't <laughs> at all. Anyhow, it's an absolutely fascinating story. What part of it would you like me to tell you? So are you saying that the uh, historians of today, when they look back at that uh, time you're referring to, these farmers and uh, people who wanted to break control from the railroads uh, is an example you gave, that they refer, the historians of today refer to them as proto-fascists because they called themselves populists? Not historians, but uh, 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 you can find this kind of, uh, this kind of attitude all over the internet and you can even find it in some um, like political science work and stuff like that. There was a historian who did make this argument. That's where it comes from. Uh, he made the argument in the 1950s uh, it was a historian called Richard Hofstadter, wrote a very famous book about, uh, about populism called The Age of Reform. And the idea was it was a study of reform movements in American history and why they had not got, you know, why they failed. And uh, he's the one that sort of came up with this stereotype of populism as a movement of, of wrongheaded um, backward looking, basically hayseeds. The idea being that farmers, you know, nothing good could come out of a movement of farmers because they were not, as he put it, they were not people of the city. They weren't uh, accustomed to complexity and big ideas. And, you know, they couldn't understand globalization and they were suspicious of economic, you know, of professional economics. Uh, and therefore they were, you know, anti-intellectual and they were, um, he, he said they were anti-Semitic and they were supposed to be xenophobic. This was all disproven uh, in a really crushing way. Uh, but it took years for it to be disproven. And uh, Hofstadter's book was a runaway popular success. He got the Pulitzer Prize for saying this. Uh, the book was a huge bestseller. It was widely taught. Uh, and nobody read the various refutations of it. I mean, there's entire books that historians wrote <laughs> refuting single chapters of Hofstadter's famous book. Uh, and uh, But this is not, you know, this is not widely known. And so what happened is that Hofstadter's redefinition of populism as a generic term denoting the pathologies of working class movements, uh, his de redefinition of populism caught on. One of the, you know, even though it was massively refuted by the American historical profession, it caught on with political scientists, it caught on with journalists, and it caught on with the general public. And so that's where the word changed. One of the reasons that it caught on that is because this is attractive to believe. 
it's difficult for people today to understand that farmers were ahead of the Ivy League, that farmers were more radical, farmers were more progressive, farmers were more open-minded than Ivy League professors. Nevertheless, it was true. And uh, uh, it was also true that uh, in some of the other movements that I, that I trace in the book, the sort of American populist tradition, the uh, CIO, the labor organization in the 1930s, it, you know, was, was one of the most you know, politically advanced uh, uh, groups of their day in the 1930s. And these are by and large not college educated people. These are by definition unskilled workers coming together in an enormous um, you know, movement of working class people. But Hofstadter's point was that you can't trust movements of working class people, that they are inherently dangerous, that working class people, they might say good things now and then, but you can give them personality tests and you can discover that they all harbor what he called the authoritarian personality. They long for racist dictator style leaders, even if they say they don't. Uh, even if, in fact, they don't, they really do. <laughs> Anyhow, this argument catches on because it's obviously extremely flattering to the sort of emergent uh, managerial professional class, right? To these kind of uh, people who are that at that moment in the 1950s coming out of uh, you know, the great universities and running the great corporations and running the departments in Washington. In fact, Hofstadter's argument is that uh, we have to put mass movements of working class people behind us and we have to entrust the running of the economy, foreign policy, all of these things. We have to entrust them to experts, uh, to people with advanced degrees. That's, uh, you know, because when these people, when you put things in the hands of people like that, you know, or lobbyists or whatever, they will get together around a table in Washington, DC and they will come up with the correct answers. And so they can manage the economy and they can manage the cold war against communism and they can deliver success. And they, uh, these guys were quite um, open about this. It's not just Hofstadter, by the way, there's a whole school of thinkers. They were called the consensus uh, scholars. This was one of their leading thinkers, Daniel Bell. It was at Harvard University, but he basically says, you know, look at the Pentagon. This is in the early 60s. Look at the Pentagon. These people are so brilliant. Robert McNamara, this is genius. You know, this is this is how things need to be run is by our cohort, people like us not by what they called populism. Po if you, you, know, you let the common people have a say in this stuff, they'll screw it up every time. Now, as of course, I'm speaking to Massachusetts Peace Action. You guys know, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story, <laughs> right? The Vietnam War, the Iraq War, you know, all of the things that these people then succeed in screwing up. We're actually living in, my own theory is that we're living in a time of epic elite failure and that the real thing for people to be studying, you know, we've got all of this literature, there's entire academic departments now that study, there's a whole pedagogy that studies uh, what they call global populism, which means, you know, these right-wing movements, these, these frightening, uh, 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 you know, demagogues all over the world. And, and oh, it's, 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 it's really uh, scary when ordinary people try to take things into their own hands and what they never uh, uh, describe or talk about or, or, or contemplate is the thing that I think is so interesting. Why do elites keep screwing things up? You know, you look at the financial crisis, then you look at the response to the financial crisis. You look at this pandemic that we're in, elites haven't exactly, I mean, Trump is a fool, but elites haven't exactly acquitted themselves all that well either. And, uh, you know, th for me, that is the uh, so much more interesting part of our, you know, of, of our of our modern world is, you know, when you cut the people out of decision making, which we really have done in this country. I mean, you there, you look at, uh, you know, these mass movements like the Farmers Alliance in the 1890s or the labor movement in the 30s and 40s and 50s. That's all gone. You know, these mass democratic movements by by which we could participate in uh, political decision making, and it really is in the hands of um, you know a tiny clique of people, and this tiny clique of people keeps screwing up. But I, I I'm getting away from 
the sort of main subject of the book, which is what I call anti-populism, which is a, uh, you know, it's, it's a kind of a, a dialectic. You have these uh, uh, thrusts by uh, left-wing popular movements like the farmers in the 1890s, the labor people in the 1930s, civil rights people in the 1960s. And then you have this counter attack that I call anti-populism and it happens uh, very predictably. Uh, and in the 1890s, well, uh, this, is the, this is the story that I wanted to come back to is how populism ended. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. So this movement is starting up in Kansas, demanding these various uh, economic reforms, uh, various political reforms. They have some success. Uh, they win in a number of Western states. Uh, they win in, in some places in the South. Um, they like they have a, the, a mayor of San Francisco <laughs> is a populist. You know, they it's the last third party movement that 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 meets with some success all across the country, and the economy goes into a tailspin in the 1890s. Uh, you know, you have a, a, a terrible uh, economic collapse, a stock market crash. Uh, you have strikes, the, the famous Pullman strike out of Chicago. The uh, What's the big steel strike? The Homestead strike happens. First ever march on Washington, led by a populist uh, in 1894. It was called Coxey's Army. Nobody remembers it anymore, but it was the first ever uh, march of the unemployed on Washington, DC. And um, it looks like the populists are the great coming thing in American politics. And what happens instead is this really fascinating story. The uh, Democratic Party gets together for their convention in 1896, presidential election year. In the depth of this depression, Democrats get together for their convention. They, uh, uh, re they reject the sitting Democratic president, Grover Cleveland. He's not gonna be their candidate. <laughs> Then they reject the gold standard itself, which is the prop of the global economy at the time. They reject the gold standard, and then they nominate for president this man that no one has ever heard of before, William Jennings Bryan, a one-term congressman from Nebraska who talks like a populist and has just given this incredible speech denouncing the gold standard. We call it the cross of gold speech. And... Um, they nominate this guy, he's 36 years old, to the incredible shock and horror of the you know, elite of America. Okay, the populist party is you know, still going at, at the time and they, they meet for their convention a few weeks later and say, well, Democrat, I know Brian personally because he's from Nebraska. He's very close to them on this one issue of the gold standard, not on any other issues, but on this one issue, which they think is important. And so they say, all right, we're going to sell out. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to endorse Brian. We're going to nominate Brian also, because if he wins, then we'll get, you know, seats in the cabinet or something like that. We'll get something good. And so they do it and they get on board and they, uh, uh, they nominate Brian as their candidate as well. And the entire establishment of America, the elite of America goes absolutely berserk with this kind of hysteria that I call a democracy scare. And uh, when I say elite, I mean, they were just one elite at the time. Today, remember how I talked about the Republicans speak for one elite group and the Democrats speak, speak for a different elite group? Well, at the time, in 1896, the elite of this country were all in the same boat. And they all got on board with the Republican candidate. His name was William McKinley. And when I say the elite, I mean university professors, I mean society preachers, uh, I mean millionaires, business tycoons, railroad owners, you know, the Vanderbilts, what have you. And uh, especially newspaper owners. The media of America against William Jennings Bryan. And it's all about putting down the threat posed by William Jennings Bryan. And these people, the, uh, the uh, Republicans and the nation's uh, ruling elite, talk themselves into believing that Bryan represents class war. Uh, and what is happening is, this, uh, is an uprising of the unfit that the lower orders of society who are on the bottom because they deserve to be on the bottom are trying to take power away from their rightful superiors, from the people who own America, who should be controlling America. And they come up with all of these different ways of describing this. By the way, I've assembled some of this 
the cartoons and stuff that they ran, which are absolutely hysterical on my website on tcfrank.com. If you go there, you can see some of the pamphlets that they put out and the, uh, the cartoons, which they, which they ran in beautiful full color, you know, describing Brian in the most horrifying terms. But uh, so they said he was, Brian was mentally ill. Uh, Brian represented a uh, class war, an uprising of the lower orders. Brian represented uh, a kind of public um, hypnosis that, you know, the, this is the very uh, origins, the very beginnings of what you, what we call crowd psychology. And so the idea was that Brian was, Brianism was a kind of mass hypnotism. And then the one word that they settled on to describe it was um, populism. This was the word they used for Brianism. They called it populism. And so this was anti-populism and uh, it, you know, it was this, the horror of democracy. Now, a lot of you guys out there have read your history and you know that this country, and by the way, we've heard a lot about this uh, just in the last few weeks, this country's founders were not fans of democracy. I mean, with the partial exception of Thomas Jefferson, maybe Ben Franklin, uh, the rest of them did not like democracy, didn't trust ordinary Americans, didn't want to let ordinary Americans have the vote, and in fact uh, wrote the Constitution in such a way as to limit uh, popular participation and to make sure that the, you know, the democracy was kept well under control. That's what the Electoral College was about. That's what the U.S. Senate was about. That's what the Supreme Court is all about to this day. And... Um, that's what you saw in 1896 was this, this exact same attitude, the horror of democracy. And my argument is that this recurs in our national life from time to time. And it recurred in the 1930s when Roosevelt was president and organized labor was on the march. Uh, and you know the New Deal was really turning America upside down. We were regulating Wall Street, breaking up monopolies. I mean, they broke up the Wall Street banks. Uh, for the first time ever, uh, you know, scrutinizing traders on Wall Street, uh, set up, you know, uh, agencies to uh, employ the unemployed, you know, the WPA, the, the CCC, et cetera, uh, you know, uh, 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 right, down the, right down the list, we were, uh, the economy was being turned on its head, power was being taken away from uh, the powerful, and they reacted in, in exactly the same way in 1936 and set up a group the first great right-wing front group to attack Roosevelt in exactly the same way they attacked uh, Brian and populism in 1896, uh, using the exact same arguments, only with a lot of uh, racism mixed in this time, uh, because this is the 30s, and so race science was a big deal by then. And uh, uh, it, it's absolutely fascinating. In 1936, though, these guys lost overwhelmingly. Uh, in 1896, they succeeded in, in destroying Bryan and crushing populism. Uh, but in 1936, the, uh, <laughs> it didn't work out that way. And Roosevelt won re-election in the great, one of the greatest landslides in American history. Anyhow, what is absolutely, and by the way, uh, Amar, you got to tell me when to shut up because I will just blab the whole evening if you don't stop me. Yeah, so okay, so that no, that's great. And I have so many follow up questions I want to ask, but uh, but I want to get other people a chance to ask some questions. So I'm going to kick it over to our member, uh, Paul Shannon. I think he has a couple questions he'd like to ask. Okay. Uh, Brian, can you unmute Paul? I think I, am I unmuted now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, Thomas, thanks very much for spending this time with us. It's I've wanted to hear you for a long time. Um, I hope you can understand that uh, just about everything that uh, we're doing right now is affected by uh, the upcoming election. And um, it's just uh, every, every I find myself just uh, evaluating everything that happens in terms of how this election is going to turn out. And uh, while I completely agree with uh, what you've written in um, in your middle book there uh, on the Democratic Party, um, I, I still, f we, most of us feel that it's absolutely essential to get rid of Trump. Oh, and, I, I, and the, of and the course. Only to, of the only course. way to do that is, uh, is through, uh, of course, B Biden. But I'm wondering if you could apply your analysis that you come up with in Listen Liberal uh, to uh, the dynamics of this election going on right now. 
Yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, and that's an excellent question, by the way. And uh, I, uh, so if you had asked me how this election was, was going a year ago or uh, in February, and you told me that Biden was going to be the candidate, I'd say Trump, Trump would eat him alive. Uh, this, but this virus has been so disastrous and his, Trump's handling of it has been so catastrophic uh, that I, I think Biden is going to win you know, despite himself. Um, you know, he's barely campaigning at all. Um, although he did go to one of my favorite hamburger stands in the world yesterday. Did you see this? He was in North Carolina at Cookout. Now, I, don't, I know you don't have Cookout in, in Massachusetts, but it's a Southern thing. Anyhow, it's a wonderful place. Um, I, you know, Biden seems like a nice guy, uh, but the, the, one of the, the things that you notice with the, you know, with the Democratic Party was their, their zeal in putting down the Bernie Sanders movement, you know, and uh, they... There, because and and I you know I've tried to understand this for a long time because not just because I'm a Bernie supporter but also because I just don't think Bernie's that scary. I I don't know why they were so enthusiastic about about making sure that he wasn't the candidate. And what I finally decided was that he represents to the Democrats um, this past that they have suppressed, you know, that they have moved themselves away from. And he sort of represents what the, you know, it's a kind of a generational thing that the, you know, the Clintons and their generation, that was their great generational project was, was severing the Democratic Party from the New Deal tradition. And so they're, you know, they're, they're pleased that they did that. And, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, Bernie was frightening to them, but, um, you know, they got their guy, it's going to be Joe Biden, I think Biden will almost certainly win. I'm, you know, in case you hadn't guessed, I'm going to go out and vote for him. But, uh, you know, I'm not I I enthusiastic about what he's going to do as president. I just want to see this current guy gone, <laughs> you know. But in some ways, it's, it is the playing out of everything I've spent my career working on. Donald Trump is the culture wars gone mad. You know, the, and do you remember in What's the Matter with Kansas, I talked about the Republican appeal to white working class voters and how it was gaining strength and they're coming up with all of these ways of doing this uh, without ever doing anything for these people and Trump is the ultimate example of that you know and then uh, uh, <clears throat> and then you know he gets in into the White House and of course what does he do you know really nice tax cuts for the wealthy <laughs> deregulates all of his friends you know all of these polluters and everything uh, and, uh, uh, and, and Biden is also the sort of the same working out of what we've seen with the Democratic Party. This is a man who is one of, was one of the, uh, the ones most responsible for making them into a party of high finance, the party of Wall Street. Do you remember he had his, uh, Biden was more responsible than, than any other Democrat for the, um, the bankruptcy bill in the Bush administration. Biden was also more responsible than any Democrat except for Bill Clinton for mass incarceration this was his baby uh and this is a this is a a terrible i mean it, it's highly ironic that in the this great year for black lives matter that this is the candidate the candidate is the guy that that engineered you know mass incarceration you know and that's who we're all supposed to get behind ordinarily the contradictions would be um would be so difficult would we would be toxic would be poisonous those contradictions would but trump is going to you know trump is is himself so vile <laughs> and just you know comes up with some new awful awfulness every single day that uh i think biden is uh, you you know there's no choice but to vote for biden and i think the country understands that and i think by we're unless something goes incredibly wrong with the mail-in ballots i think biden's got this thing in the bag not that he deserves to, but that's that's where we are today. And I wonder how we're all going to look back at this in 10 years, because in some ways the Democrats got exactly the opponent they wanted. Do you remember when Hillary was, oh, we know this now that, uh, that, that, that the Hillary campaign back in 16 wanted Trump to be the Republican candidate because he's so outrageous and he's such a, you know, a liar and a 
a fool and a fraud and a, and a you know an asshole, right? I mean, let's be blunt here. And that's what they wanted because that's what they love to campaign against a guy who just absolutely unthinkable for their perspective. Uh, uh, unfortunately, then you know, the asshole pulled it off somehow, you know, to to everyone's undying chagrin. I, and I often think back to that election because uh, you and I didn't get played, but a lot of people who think like us did get played. I know lots of labor guys that voted for Trump. Now, I can't say I know a lot of peace movement guys that voted for Trump, but he, sure, he tried hard to win their votes. I mean, there's, you can't ignore that he did that right he talked about the endless wars and uh i mean anybody could there was a discussion in the peace movement about whether he was you know going to end the wars faster than right but we could also see that he was insincere you know that that that, i mean that that he didn't mean it he didn't mean any of it Uh, i mean he's saying it again now he's saying he's going to get the the troops out of afghanistan he'll say anything (laughs) you know but uh, uh, we were sitting there this afternoon in a meeting wondering whether Biden or, or Trump would be better in Afghanistan. And we don't know. Yeah. That's where we are. I, I, I don't know either. And uh, uh, I mean, the, the thing is that he has become Trump has just become so I, I used to be able in 2016, I was able to look at him and say, uh, you know, he is he talks in a really vile way. But, you know, uh, we can we can we can have a conversation about him. I, I don't feel like you can do that anymore. Uh, we know we know what he is. Uh, we know what he does, and it's not good. <laughs> there's nothing. There's nothing wholesome about this guy. It is just poison. But here's the here's the here's the thing that is really interesting to me. This is not going to end with Biden's victory. I suspect Biden will be a a very weak president. Just based on what we know about Biden and his career and where he is in life uh, and the kind of man that he is. I suspect Biden will be a very weak president. And I suspect that in four years, you're going to see another Trump, not the current president, but maybe his son, or you're going to see a Trumpist. You're going to see Ted Cruz, who's a very capable politician, having completely swallowed the uh, Trump agenda. And so my warning is, you know, if everything goes according to plan and Biden wins in a couple of weeks, great. You're going to have four years to figure it out, Democrats. Four years to figure out your way out of this cul-de-sac that we are in, okay? Because if they don't start beating these guys, if they don't you know, figure out a way to win back those white working class voters that Trump took away from them, or you know the peace movement guys that Trump took away from them, admittedly a smaller group, but if they don't figure out a way to win these people back, they're in big trouble. And so what I mean by this is that when Biden is in the White House, he and his people have to sit down and seriously reconsider the direction the Democratic Party has been going in for a long time. Uh, and I, frankly, I, they're not they're not going to do that. So. So then what do we Let's do? Let's talk about the past. <laughs> Let's talk about history some more. I'm I sorry. One. Go ahead, Amar. If we want to, well, actually, I had a question, but let me kick it off to Brian. He's our co-moderator after all. Sure, sure. I have a, a quick one for you. This is one that I've, I, I only just thought of uh, as you were talking about, uh, about the gold standard and, and, and Brian. I, I thought of... Um, I thought of uh, President Eisenhower and his speech early in, in his first uh, in his first term uh, about humanity being crucified on a cross of iron. Uh, I I Did just realized he must that. he must have been referring. Oh, of course he to was. Williams yeah, definitely. Jenny, uh, definitely. Brian. Yeah. Um, well, it's one of the most famous metaphors in in uh, you know political history. Uh, I've used it myself uh, on many occasions. Uh, by the way, Eisenhower, a Kansan. There's a great exactly. man for yes. you, a, a underrated president. Uh, if you guys are ever out in Kansas City, the Harry Truman Library is in Kansas City, and then you drive about 100 miles out into Kansas, out into the complete empty zone, and you get to the Eisenhower Library. Um, again, we, we don't have a whole lot to be proud of, <laughs> but Eisenhower is, is it, <clears throat> Eisenhower is one of them, yeah, but I interrupted my, you. 
No, my question was going to be about uh, peace uh, as a as a populist issue. Uh, recent polling, I think, from the Eurasia Group uh, has shown two to one that people want military spending to be decreased and and that money brought home. People want these uh, forever wars to be ended. Yeah. But it doesn't seem like either of the major parties uh, want to give the people what they want. Uh, <laughs> I yep. think this is why Biden is so vulnerable on this and, and why Trump is, is able to make these claims, insincere though, though he might be. Uh, I, I wondered if you, you might elaborate a little bit about peace and populism. Yeah, excellent, excellent question. Um, the populists in their very short political life, uh, uh, one of the things that killed them was the Spanish-American War. There were very, they, they were, there were only a few of them left in Congress by 1898, but uh, that pretty much wiped them out. They were, um, they were initially in support of, uh, you know, of the uh, Cuban revolutionaries, you know, revolting against Spain. You know, they were anti-colonial, obviously, but uh, the the sort of war fever, as you guys know, war fever tends to kill left-wing movements and populism was sort of the first example of that. Uh, they, uh, in 1900, William Jennings Bryan ran for president again and was nominated by the Democrats again. Pop the populists were by this time uh, almost gone. Uh, but he was, he, he, he was nominated by the Democrats again and he ran on openly on the issue of, of uh, anti-imperialism because by this time, William McKinley had announced we had taken over uh, the Philippines from Spain, and we were occupying the Philippines as a colonial power, and had and McKinley had basically rolled out a whole sort of um, um, ideology of imperialism. He wanted to play the same game that the uh, British and French were playing, and lest we forget, the Portuguese were also playing, and the Belgians, and <laughs> the Germans, and everybody else, <clears throat> and he wanted a piece of that action, and he was going to I believe he wanted to Christianize the Philippines, which is kind of a joke because they were already a Catholic nation. And, um, and Brian and the Democrats actually uh, uh, ran against him on an anti-imperialism platform. That is what they, you know, that was the, that was the campaign issue that year. In 1896, it was the gold standard. In 1900, it was imperialism. The Democrats were against imperialism on the grounds that a democracy should not be an imperial power. And uh, Brian, you know, he lost pretty badly that time. <laughs> in 1896, it had been a little bit closer, but in 1900, he got wailed on. But I wanna just remind you, and Brian was a pacifist. We always think of him, we always uh, think of Brian as a fool and a buffoon because his, his life went downhill, you know, and he, he, it ended in this rather pathetic manner where he was, uh, attacking the theory of evolution you know, at the monkey trial in, in Tennessee, you know, and, and he managed, he succeeded in embarrassing himself really, really badly. He was a fundamentalist Christian or became one over the course of his life. But among other things, he was also a pacifist. I mean, off and on, he was not a, um, a uniformly good man or a hero for our modern times or anything like that, but he was right on a lot of the issues and he was right on that one. And he saw that World War I was a disaster. And when president, he was President Wilson's Secretary of State and he saw that Wilson wanted to get in that war and he, he wanted nothing to do with it and resigned over it. Uh, and so he, from time to time was capable of doing, you know, of doing the right thing. But I, my point here isn't that, that Brian was, um, you know, a great uh, leader or anything like that. All of those politicians back then had something wrong with them and he's no exception. But I, I just want to point out to you that anti-imperialism is capable of rousing enormous mass support in this country. And we shouldn't just, you know, uh, you know, surrender on that issue. This can be anti-imperialism can be a popular issue. And it's it's totally possible to bring together, as a man like Brian did, anti-imperialism and fundamentalism. You know, today those two things seem like incredibly far apart for us, but back then that made perfect sense. He used to go around the country giving the same speeches over and over and over again. This is how he made his living. And uh, he would give one about Jesus called the Prince of Peace. And, you know, we could, we could use a shot of that today, I think. 
Thanks, Tom. Uh, yeah, how do we how do we increase uh, support for the anti-imperialist movement across the country? Well, this is the, I have to tell you this is not my you know my subject. I've never researched that, and I haven't really ever given it a whole lot of thought. But I know you can do it. I know it can be done. And I know that I think this is the important thing. It should not be a, a movement for highly educated people. This is one of the sort of the toxic things that came out of the 60s. You had this great anti-war movement that opposed the Vietnam War and eventually succeeded in stopping it. You know, this great triumph. But it also succeeded in, um, it, it split the left. You know, you had the labor movement where a lot of their leaders were supporting the war, not because they particularly believed in it, but because they were supporting President Johnson uh, and they were anti-communist and stuff like that. And you had a, a huge part of this country decided, this is all covered in the last chapter of The People Know. It's like how, how the left came apart. You had people who blamed the soldiers for the war and who blamed blue collar people yeah. in general for the war. And as, as we all know, the Vietnam War was a product of the political science profession. I mean, I hate to say that, but you know that's true. Robert McNamara and all those other guys, you know that book, uh, The Best and the Brightest. It, it, it wasn't labor unions that got us into that war. Yes, they thought they were being good guys and supporting Johnson in that thing. And they, and it just, it's just, a, it's a tragedy what happened the way the left came apart over that war. But it became, the, the, the idea that became enshrined was that opposing Vietnam was something you had to be an educated person to do. And that's a toxic idea. That's a bad idea. Because what you guys are fighting for and what you guys are supporting is something that everyone should be, that should be open and available and common, the common sense of the millions. And it was, I mean, 1900 was a long time ago. Okay, and 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 populism was a long time ago, but that is in our blood. That is that democratic, you know, that we, we should resist and despise and hate imperialism. That is what a democracy is, and everybody in this country can understand that. And I just there's got to be a way to get back to that sensibility and make that the common sense of the millions. By the way, it was that again during you know uh, World War II. It was actually very difficult for Roosevelt to persuade the public to get involved in that because the, the experience of World War I had been so dreadful. You know, people had been enthusiastic about World War I. <laughs> they, they learned you know a terrible, terrible lesson. Anyhow, you guys know this history better than I do. But that's the task: is to make this a mass make the left into a mass movement again. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's one of our objectives. That, that's what we want to do. We don't want the anti-war movement to be all people with college degrees and advanced degrees. It should be a mass movement. Um, for our next question, I'm going to kick it over to Mary Ellen, a mass peace action member from Fall River. From Fall River? Hi. Yeah, I'm from Fall River. Well, so, hey, you how are you? Yeah, I'm doing okay. Actually, I I am interested in asking you about Fall River because um, it's I'd like to hear a little bit more about our populist legacy because um, I have this great photograph of um, Anne Burlack, who was um, you know there's a picture of her she's surrounded by throngs of mill workers in the 30s and you look back at that so wistfully because. Right now, we've been so systematically disenfranchised. You know, there's the gerrymandering. There's the, uh, the legacy of the Southern strategy, the, uh, the state legislature, the non-transparent machinations. Yep. And we're called a gateway city, but frankly, it feels like we're the thrown away city. And here, I've, from some recent um, events and actions that we've had, you know, there's a sizable support for Trump in the city but, but it, it probably will go for Biden, but in particular, the, the suburbs are very strong for Trump. And I, I don't know, can you elaborate on um, the legacy a little bit? Maybe I can understand. 
well, how we got here. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, I wrote about Fall River uh, in Listen Liberal. I, I visited the city and, uh, and I was really struck by the, uh, just to, for the starting point here, the sort of visual vista of the city where you have those the abandoned mills, you know what I'm talking about? And they're, they're six or seven stories high. They're very striking, the appearance of them. And when Trump gave his inaugural address, for which he was widely mocked, do you remember this? And he talked about um, the, the uh, abandoned factories like tombstones in our nation. I thought of Fall River. I'm like, oh my God, he's talking about Fall River. He didn't say that, but that was a straight up shout out. I mean, as, as, as close as I've ever heard. And so it wouldn't surprise me that Fall River, see, they know I'm on with you. They're, now they're phoning me. They've been emailing me, <laughs> now, they're, now they're phoning me. And I can't turn it off. Um, I'm just going to ignore it. This happens every time I do a Zoom a Zoom conference call. Every, I, literally every single time. I do, no one calls all day, and then they they know that I'm doing this, and then they phone me. <laughs> but uh, Fall River, I, I, what you said, it's that you know the thrown away city. That's exactly right because the Democrats don't have they have no plan uh, for reindustrializing America. What they have a plan for is like is like uh, shoehorning more big, more pharmaceutical companies into Cambridge, you know, and for building a, an economy that is based entirely on universities and stuff like that. But, but industry, bringing back, uh, bringing back the textile industry, no way. They, they have no plan. They have no scheme. Um, it really and, feels and, and, that and it way. looks like Trump yeah. does Trump doesn't have one either. I mean, he said he did, but that's like Nixon saying he had a secret plan to get us out of Vietnam. It was just bullshit. And uh, I, but it, I remember uh, I, so in in researching uh, my new book, the people know I read a lot of labor stuff from the 1930s and a lot of stuff about the organizing drives in Fall River, and it was one of those uh, really inspiring moments in our democracy. You know, and all the different ethnic groups in, in Fall River coming together and, uh, you know, and, and organizing those mills and a, a wonderful, wonderful time. And yeah, it's uh, that's that's the time when people like us were winning. And anyhow, and now it's all it's all going in reverse. I don't have an answer for Fall River. Um, I think that there's no reason, you know, I'm not a working politician or anything there's no reason you couldn't have one though there's there is there are answers for everything people often say you know they talk about farm communities where in the part of the world that i'm from kansas and missouri where small towns in kansas and small towns in missouri look like fall river they're deindustrialized. Right. they're they're empty their downtowns are in ruins uh you know, it, it makes you cry to go through these towns and to see what has happened to them and when the two parties, you know, when the Democrats say, we got nothing for you, you know, the answer for you is to go to MIT. That's not an answer. And here comes Trump saying, oh, I'm going to make it great again. Well, you know, that's better than the people saying there's no answer. Of course, he didn't do anything. But there are things that would make a difference. There are like one of the things I always point out, enforcing antitrust laws. I don't know if that would help Fall River, but it would sure as hell help Kansas, it would help Missouri, it would help, uh, uh, you know, farm towns in farm country. Uh, there are all sorts of things you could do, uh, but they would be costly and they would benefit people who aren't billionaires and who don't donate to campaigns and who didn't go to college. Uh, and so in other words, they're not gonna happen. In other words, the only way to make them happen is to do it ourselves. So a, a populist mm -hmm. movement, I never gave you my definition of a populist movement. What, what you learn when you study the history of populism and movements, you know, our populist tradition in America, by which I would include organized labor, uh, civil rights, et cetera, et cetera, is that a populist movement is when people from different racial, ethnic backgrounds, working class people come together for economic democracy. So working class people from different races coming together for economic liberalism. And What's, what you see when you study this history is that it's, you know, uh, you have to have leaders. Leaders are important. You have to have Franklin Roosevelt, but you also have to have organized labor. 
you know, William Jennings Bryan is important, but you also have to have the farmers alliance. You have to have the mass movement of farmers. You know, Lyndon Johnson is important, but you have to have the civil rights movement. You have to have the anti-war movement out there. And what I, what I have learned is that mass movements are how reform is, is made in America, is how reform is done in our country, in our history, in a democracy. In other words, that Richard Hofstadter, the historian I was talking about a half hour ago, Richard Hofstadter had it entirely upside down. Reform is not made by you know, a bunch of lobbyists in DC. It's not made by a bunch of really highly educated people sitting around the mahogany table and coming to consensus with one another. Reform is made by people like you and me building a mass movement. That's how it's done. That's how you get results. It's how you get change. And that's the only way you're going to save a place like Fall River. And it's not much of an answer, but that's what I got. By the way, I really liked Fall River. I'm so upside down. I'm so backwards. I really like places like that. We need you. <laughs> If these mass movements are going to come from everyday regular people, how are they going to know what to do without their advanced degrees? You know? <laughs> well, this is okay. That's uh, that is a great question. We're and I see we're almost out of time, so you saved the best question for last, because you know what everybody says. There's all these works books about populism that came out the last few years, and they call populism anti-intellectual. It's a movement that's against uh, elites, by which they mean uh, highly educated people. It's a movement that rejects science. None of that is true. Uh, populism was, you know, if you look at the history of it, they did not reject science. It's true they didn't go, they weren't highly educated people. They were farmers. You know, by definition, they probably hadn't even gone to high school, but they thirsted for ideas. They loved knowledge. And the populist movement had this army of lecturers that would go, that would travel around the country lecturing to huge gatherings of farmers. You know what the Chautauqua movement was? Yeah. This was basically a continuation of populism. Uh, but the idea was to bring uh, highly educated people out to the hinterlands and they would give, uh, you know, they would, they would, they would lecture to uh, farmers. They, these farmers were hungry for learning. And there was a whole culture of pamphlets. Uh, and newspapers. So in, in like in my, in my home state of Kansas, every small town had its own newspaper. But back then, they'd usually have more than one. They'd have a Republican one, and they'd have a populist one, and they'd go at it hammer and tongs. But the populist one would make it its business to talk about, you know, uh, 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 counter-orthodox economic theories that were going around, like Henry George and stuff like that, uh, and to talk about big ideas the populists were intensely curious about big ideas, but no, they were not, uh, they did not support the gold standard, the toast of the economics profession. They believed in all sorts of ideas that were not in the mainstream orthodoxy of their day, but the punchline, anybody that studies populism, the, 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 what you come away from it, you know, they were denounced and reviled by the academic elite of their day because they rejected the gold standard and they rejected modern economics. But the punchline is the populists were right. <laughs> the gold standard was a terrible, terrible thing. Everybody knows that today. Almost nobody stands up for the gold standard anymore. Uh, the populists were right about the, the, the great intellectual questions. And so what, the, what I keep coming, and the same is true in the 1930s, the labor movement wasn't hostile to learning or hostile to ideas. They just had, or the, the New Deal, Franklin Roosevelt wasn't hostile to ideas, but he did bring in ideas from a lot of, of uh, out of the way places. He brought in economists who were not in the mainstream of the profession. As uh, there's a famous article by, uh, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, who worked for Roosevelt, and he was evaluating Roosevelt's uh, economic advisors. And he said, look, if he had accepted the mainstream economic wisdom of 1932, he would have been no different from Herbert Hoover. Hoover was surrounded by economists that were telling him what to do, and it was terrible advice. And Roosevelt brought in all of these people from out of the way places, these heterodox thinkers, you know, uh, crackpots, basically. And again, the, the cranks, they were derided as cranks and the cranks turned out to be right. And so when you look at these modern day books attacking populism, because it's supposed to be hostile to ideas, what they mean, they say, oh, populism hates elites. Populism won't listen to expertise. What populism won't listen to is them. 
Mm. It won't listen to the, uh, you know, the guy, the, 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 the professional monopoly. As we all know, all, mon all professions are essentially a monopoly on ideas and they have a built-in ideology like the economics profession, the, probably the profession I'm most familiar with. Uh, the economics profession acts as a group to keep out uh, ideas that it doesn't approve of. They have all of these me methods for every profession does this, but the economics profession mm -hmm. is notorious for doing it and also for protecting the insiders who are all, uh, almost always wrong, as we all know. They're wrong all the time. They're wrong. They're wrong again. They, you know, they predict things that never happen. They say things will not happen that then take place. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, it's a study in folly this profession, but they've been very, very good, very successful at keeping out outsiders, out of their profession, out of their, their field of expertise. All professions do this. Populism wants to break that down. Populism is about when ideas, when we all participate in ideas and we're all participating in economics and we're all reading this literature. I'm gonna show you one last, one last bit of show and tell and then we'll probably have to, 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 to end this. This is sort of how populism, one of the things that populism ended with. It was a, a, a guy in Kansas who put out these pamphlets. You see this, this is a debate, Clarence Darrow and I forget. Anyhow, they were, you could get them for five cents, five cents. And this is like farmers bought them. They sold them in vending machines. What is a liberal? <laughs> they sold them in vending machines. Farmers bought them. Studs Terkel mm -hmm. talks about them. You'd see them. Um, hobos would carry them around. They were pocket sized. You could put them in your overalls, you know. Uh, uh, labor union members always had them. Uh, you'd see them in hospitals. You'd see them in prisons. And you'd send the guy a dollar in Girard, Kansas, and he'd send you 20 of them. And the whole idea was that I, and he said this openly, he was not a college graduate, the guy that, that did this pamphlet series. We're going to kick down the doors of learning so that everyone can participate. Mm -hmm. And that was a great idea. And uh, uh, it was an immensely successful operation. He sold hundreds of millions of these pamphlets for five cents a piece. And that's populism. That's what it's about. It's not hostile to ideas. It just demands that everybody be allowed to participate. And, you know, in my life, I've discovered there is a real hunger for that. People love learning. They love reading history. They love understanding the world. And it, the more we open that up, you know, I got a PhD and all that stuff, but I'm not employed in academia anymore. And my whole object in life is to write books that, you know, to take on big ideas and make and describe them in a way that anybody can read. Oh my God. Okay. Now I'm going to go faint. Tom, um, we were uh, we we were under the impression that uh, the event would go to eight thirty. Um, eight thirty. Okay, that's fine. I'm sorry, I, I had forgotten that. Okay, so you let's do keep it. going. Okay, awesome, great. Well, in that case, let's get to Louise Coleman. She is, by the way, a Mass Peace Action member and also the brainchild of this whole event. Hi, Louise. Hi. Um. Well, what I wanted to know was um, how we can use this transformational um, time. I mean, we don't have an FDR. Um, we have come out of a, or are coming out of a really horrible, horrible, horrible time. We don't have an FDR. We only have ourselves. And I just, it just feels like it is depressing that more isn't possible, but it just seems like a terrible time to waste. Is it? It, well, all we have looks like are us. Um, and so how do we galvanize people? I mean, it seems like one of the main issues that people are most interested in is this whole thing about um, all the money that's being wasted on nuclear weapons. I mean, it's yeah. billions and billions of dollars and it's, it's just a total horror show and it's totally self-destructive. Um, so how do we get people interested in not doing that and uh, making more ventilators and... Um, uh, yeah. Vaccinations. I totally know what you mean. And okay. so there we are. And I feel that I feel depressed myself all the time. And uh, I had a friend that wrote an essay at the beginning of COVID. I really liked the essay. It was a great essay. He talked about how this should be a time of social solidarity, which is a word that I really like and I think is really important solidarity. And instead, we've 
had the exact opposite. And I don't just mean Republicans and Democrats fighting with each other. I mean, uh, the Republicans clearly understand that their future is tied up with the opposite of solidarity with, you know, getting us at each other's throats. But also just in a practical way, you know, we have to, you don't get dare go to large public places. I mean, the whole idea of a mass movement, people coming together, we can't do that in a pandemic. And you, you know, if you do go outside, you have to wear a mask and it's, it's, it's necessarily um, anti-solidarity and it, uh, you know, it destroys our sense of solidarity. And it also, it makes, I mean, the, the feeling out there in the land these days is, is anxiety uh, and fear uh, and to, to a certain degree, horror. I mean, people are having trouble sleeping. Um, you know, you turn on the internet in the morning, you turn on Twitter, and it's just like, you can't believe what is going on in the world. I, I mean, I know you guys all feel the same. We're all feeling it. And and I'm still looking for the bright side of it. I mean, it, it can't just be that the bright side is Joe Biden as president. That can't, that can't be enough. Uh, and I, I want to know also, you know, what is the great thing that's going to come out of this. I would love to see a great sense of social solidarity, but I don't know how that comes about in this situation that we're in. Um, I, I honestly don't know. Now, my friends, my liberal friends here in DC and, and uh, elsewhere in America are constantly talking about how we have to pressure Biden once he is, once Biden is president, we constantly have to pressure him you know, to, to do the right thing. And uh, I don't have high hopes for that. And then my own pet theory, which I rolled out for you earlier, that, that Biden will be forced by the prospect of a, of a, of a renewed Trumpism, that Biden will be forced to, ta- to reevaluate the course of the Democratic Party. Well, he's not going to do that. Um, and it, it has to be movement building. You know, it, it has to come out of this and we have to all get better at doing things on the Internet. But but frankly, I'm as scared as you and I don't know. I, I don't know how to build a mass movement. I wish I did. I, I mean, one of the things that I know you do is you, uh, you know, you organize around shared experiences, particularly economic ones. But these days, it seems like all our shared experiences are on TV. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Uh, so I, I, you know, I, I don't have a great answer for you, Louise. I'm sorry. All right. For our next question, let's kick it over to Mass Peace Action's Executive Director, Cole Harrison. Uh, thanks, Samar. I'm going to show a map of the Marquis Kennedy race. Um, that uh, primary was on September 1. And... There's a, there was a clean geographical division between the towns that Markey won and the towns that Kennedy won. Markey is red or orange, Kennedy is green. And for those who know the geography of Massachusetts, I don't know if you can see my mouse yeah, pointer I as I yeah. go, but but this is kind of your 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 west your your relatively liberal affluent suburbs of Boston. This is your horse country up here. This is your your hill towns in the Berkshires. So these are relatively affluent areas that went for uh, Markey. And uh, Kennedy wins not only the more rural areas, right, but also the industrial towns, including Fall River, including Worcester, Springfield, Lawrence, Lowell. Um, so we campaigned hard for Markey. The uh, Sunrise Movement campaigned hard for Markey. We were relieved that he won. Um, uh, But this appears to reflect a clear class distinction. Um, So how do we read this, I guess, is my question. So the you know that's that's a little too uh, detailed for me. If we're talking about if we're yeah. talking about Missouri or Kansas, I might be able to yeah, sorry. <laughs> I might be able to yeah. help you out. Uh, well, because I, I what I know about Massachusetts for, for is there's more than one factor at uh, at, at play here. Um, and look, there's it, this is the, things like this are happening all over America, as we all know, um, where liberalism has become a taste of highly affluent people you know it's the reverse of what it's historically been 
Um, I mean, I'm here in Bethesda, Bethesda, Maryland, and, uh, uh, you know, I haven't seen a Trump sign. I mean, I ride my bike all around the neighborhood. I haven't seen a Trump sign yet. I'm originally from Johnson County, Kansas, right. which is the most, you know, affluent suburbs of Kansas City. And when I was a kid was the most, one of the most Republican places in America, like Orange County, California. It was like that. And uh, it's going for Biden this year, almost for sure. I'm actually going to, I'm yeah. flying out there in order to write about it uh, because it's so shocking to me, you know, that the, that's the, I think Orange, I think Orange County's changing. It went for Hillary. Yeah. Heard. Hillary but, won Orange County in yeah. 16. It's quite remarkable. Yeah. Uh, but this is happening. This is happening wherever you go. And uh, so the question is, how do we get out of this, right? If you want the Democrats to change, yep. then where's, you know, where's the, where's the political impetus to do that? And how do we, out of the progressives or the Bernieites or whatever it is that's going to fix this, what's their political So they, First what's of all, you have to understand future? that this is why the Democrats, you've put your finger on why the Democrats don't want to change. They like being the uh, party of affluent people. You know, that's, that's, that's a, that's a sweet place to be. Um, you, I noticed Martha's Vineyard went for went for Marky, and I, you know, I, I went out to Martha's Vineyard too because it it, it is it is identified in the public mind with uh, this is where wealth and Democrats, you know, this is where they come together on, yeah. and and exchange yeah. stuff out on uh, out on Martha's Vineyard. This is where the magic happens. Well, like you said, there's two groups of elites. Right? Yeah, there's the, there's the Republican elites and the Democratic elites, which are maybe a little broader. It goes, you know, into that top twenty percent or whatever you want to call yeah. it. But yeah, well, they just elite. they come from different uh, different backgrounds. So the Democratic elites tend to be the ones whose elite status is based on educational attainment. Uh, meritocracy, basically. Uh, by the way, there's an excellent book. Uh, you guys in Boston would be interested in. Uh, there's a. I write a lot about meritocracy and listen, liberal and the Democratic Party's increasing sort of faith in and identification with um, fancy uh, colleges and you know high SAT scores and education as the answer to to everything. Uh, there's a wonderful book that came out last year about meritocracy, uh, the meritocracy trap, that's what it was. And uh, uh, basically, you know, it, it makes the case that um, uh, higher ed based meritocracy has, has essentially become the American elite, that the, this group is now uh, bigger than the Republican elite, bigger than the oil elite, uh, you know, more powerful, they control Wall Street, you know, Wall Street, has gone just in our lifetimes from being when Reagan was president, being deeply conservative, deeply Republican, to today being uh, largely Democratic. Uh, uh, Silicon Valley, same deal. Remember when Silicon Valley, geez, it wasn't in the 90s, was supposed to be the shrine of libertarianism. You know, George Gilder would yeah. go out there and write these books about <laughs> Silicon Valley and their amazing political values. And today they're like, you know, they are uh, uh, one with the Democratic Party or a big pharma, of course, uh, or any of the you know, basically what what I'm describing are, are, are uh, extremely powerful industries that are based on educational attainment, based on innovation. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, you're very familiar with that in Massachusetts. How do you undo it? Well, what a question. So, because all my life I've been saying, don't do this, Democrats, don't go down that path. Well, they've done it and they've arrived. You know, this is a done deal now. Uh, you know, the, 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 the Democratic Party that was a party of labor unions and that kind of thing, that's, that's over, that's in the past. Um, how do you bring them back? Well, first you have to persuade them that they want to go back. I mean, this is what I've been doing all my life. They're not, you can't persuade them. They don't, they aren't, they aren't interested in that. Uh, I mean, you look at a guy like Walter Mondale, who was sort of the last Democrat who was fully part of that really old uh, tradition, that new deal tradition. And uh, you know, uh, he doesn't get to retire to, where is it that the Clintons live now? Uh, where they, they live in like Pleasantville, New York or some Westchester in a, you know, on a compound somewhere. He doesn't get to do that. He doesn't get to have a, you know, uh, this wonderful career as a billionaire, <laughs> you know, or you look at Harry Truman, the last president that didn't go to college. And uh, he didn't have 
an income when he was done being president. He didn't have any way of earning money. Uh, you know, he didn't have a pension or anything. <laughs> And uh, uh -huh. he had to, uh, you know, and eventually he set up his the first presidential library. It's in Kansas City. Like I said, you should go visit it if you ever uh -huh. out there. He had to raise the money himself. And I think he raised about a million dollars and it cost it cost a little over a million dollars. This is in the 1950s. And you look at that, even adjusted for inflation, that's about $10 million today. Well, the George W. Bush Library, which is the most recent one built, is like $500 million. Yeah, and the Obama, yeah, yeah. the Obama Library is going to put that in the shade. You know, it's going to be like a billion dollars. And, and, you know, who wants to be the party of Harry Truman and Walter Mondale or Jimmy Carter, you know, working on, on you know, building, uh, uh, you know, shelters for homeless people? Who wants to be that? nobody <laughs> they like being the party of the rich that's fun that's a comfortable yeah. place to be and as long as they can say well you know so so we don't really have an appeal to the public we don't really have a proposition to the public that they're interested in buying but every now and then the republicans screw things up so badly that we can't help but win right <laughs> you're right it's happening right now it happened with george w bush right they the republicans you can always count on these guys to screw things up and the you know the democrats also have i don't know if you guys know any sort of democratic party people but they have a theory that they always talk about which is basically they call it the coalition of the ascendant and it's basically that they don't have to do anything because demographics dictate that they're going to win. You know, the Republican voters, their demographics are shrinking. Uh, Democratic voters, you know, recent immigrants, et cetera, uh, their demographics are growing. Therefore, all they all right. they, and what this leads to, you see where this is going. This leads to extreme complacency on the part of the Democrats. They literally don't have to give anyone anything. People will just keep voting for them. And it, and it also leads to among the Demo Republicans, desperation and a certain amount of dynamism because they're like, well, wait, our, you know, our little demographic island is shrinking. We got to reach out to people. We got to try new things. And that hence Trumpism. You know, you have Trump reaching out to uh, uh, blue collar, white blue collar workers and stuff like that. And they'll try other things too. I mean, you see Trump right now, it's, it's despicable what he's doing right now, but he's you can see him trying it. He's got this 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 scheme for reaching out to black voters. He's got a scheme for reaching out to Latino voters, uh, neither of which is yielding, uh, you know, is, is doing very, reached doing very much. But, moms. but imagine yeah, those imagine those too. in the hands of somebody that's not a jerk, you know, <laughs> that's not a that's not right, a bigot. Right, right. You know, anyhow, where are we right, going with this? Right. What's going to drive the Democrats back? Unfortunately, I don't see how you do it. A hundred years ago, I'd say you start a third party. Uh, mm -hmm. And 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 uh, you you threaten them with that. Uh, and I. Uh, <laughs> You know, I've been poo-pooing third parties for a long time, and maybe I should stop doing that because I'm starting to think that might be the only way out. But now, wait a minute. There is a way out. There is a way out. I shouldn't be so negative. There is a way out. And who showed us the way out? None other than the asshole himself, Donald Trump. Because this guy goes into the Republican Party. I always thought, all my life, I thought the Republicans were the well-oiled machine you know what i'm talking about like you know they're like the military they're like everybody gets in line and follows orders but i'll be damned this guy shows up and destroys the bush machine and beats 16 other republicans you know and just collapses the entire party and now they've turned into a cult of donald trump himself that's a well, that's what we tried to do with Bernie, right, but, but, but it's, you know we didn't but quite win. Compare Bernie to uh, <laughs> compare Bernie to his pal Ralph Nader. Nader got nowhere doing the third party yeah, thing, and no, look what Bernie did. Now Bernie is a uh, we all know now Bernie is a one of a kind guy. Uh, he had a weird kind of low key charisma that's going to be hard to replicate. It's going to be hard to find another Bernie. But we will find them, I guarantee you. Uh, when Bernie first ran, I interviewed him in 2014. It was before he had announced, but everybody knew he was going to announce. And I interviewed him, and, and, and he was a great guy. And I really liked him and, you know, all that stuff. But it was not, uh, it was hard to see, it was hard to take him seriously, especially in Washington, D.C. This town regarded him as a crank. 
and that nobody thought that he had a chance. And he gave them such a scare in 16 and then such a scare again this year. We keep building and we're going to uh, we're going to do what Trump did to the Republican Party. And it's going to be beautiful. It's let me. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be. <laughs> It'll be tremendous. <laughs> I, ho- I hope you're say, right. It's going to be big league, big league. <laughs> We're going to get tired of winning. <laughs> I hope you. I hope you're right. Tom, I got to ask you about your t-shirt. Exactly, tired of winning. Yeah. Tell us about your T-shirt. Oh, I got it at a thrift store in uh, Quebec City. I, I I used to like to go to Quebec on vacation, right? Because it's here in in North America. It's not that far, and, and they speak a foreign language. <laughs> <laughs> and I and so I can I can parley and petite put a Franzi so uh, so I like to go up there. They have a great they, music festival too. Thank yes, I, I, <laughs> and they're you know they are really nice people and it's beautiful country and I and and look Quebec City and Montreal those are wonderful places to visit. So that's I don't even know what it signifies. I have no idea. Twenty thirteen, May twenty thirteen, month of trees and forests. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what that means. I got it at a thrift store. I like it. Thank you. But to to that point that you were just talking about, uh, I I I, in my opinion, I think one of the one of the big mistakes of the Sanders campaign is was an unwillingness to to criticize the Democratic establishment to the same extent that Trump uh, yeah. was was willing to. But uh, one, I know he, you, he t- you talked it. about. He did do it yeah. in 16 and he got a lot of pushback for that. I wonder if he was, you know, uh, gun shy in 2020 um, or, yeah. or if that if he discovered that was not a selling uh, a good way to make the sale. But like a, a lot of the lines in this, I mean, Sanders was saying really similar things uh, after a fashion. Um, yeah, you you had you you talked a little bit about the meritocracy and and the credentialism and and some of those whiz kids that really got us into a into a lot of uh, a lot of trouble. I think one of the one of the worst legacies of the Hillary Clinton campaign. There's no yeah, better example of it. Where absolutely. are they now? They're like they're at Harvard now. <laughs> I think <laughs> they're teaching. I, I think one of the worst legacies of Trump may be uh, the fact that we do need an outsider to solve some of these problems that we've gotten into. And God, Donald Trump has really given outsiders a, a bad name with the yes, job that he's done. Yes, that's right. And and he certainly has. But uh, I mean, the idea that he's that he represents uh, what out the outsiders have to offer, I think, is going to be one of his more poisonous legacies, because I, I also think I mean, Franklin Roosevelt was an outsider. He was a Democrat. He was a well-known Democrat, had run for office many times before, had been governor of New York, but but brought in total outsiders to the point where the Democratic Party actually turned against him in 1936. Not the convention, they renominated him, but the like uh, Al Smith, his predecessor as, as presidential candidate, endorsed the Republican. So did the presidential candidate before him. So did like all of these other leading Democrats. Uh, outsiders are, uh, come on, even according to the sort of um, orthodox ideas of innovation, you got to have creativity, you got to bring in fresh people, you got to have new ideas. And this is one of the, I think this is one of the the places where Obama, I mean, just for my my personal history, now we really are coming up against the end of this. But from my, my personal story, I was a a great believer in Barack Obama in 2008. I had um, I had met him. I, I had gone to graduate school at the University of Chicago, and so I lived in Hyde Park. I, I lived I'd lived there for a long time, and uh, he was the state senator. You would meet him at house parties, and I had met him. And like everybody else in Hyde Park, I I it, re- it really admired him, and I thought he was um, uh, you know brilliant uh and you know had you know he was incredible he was like everything you could want in a leader and uh i was so excited when he got elected it was like i couldn't believe it it was so wonderful a guy who had been my state senator was going to be president of the united states and i thought he was exactly the right man for 2008 i mean exactly we here we were in a replay of 1932 you know, with the economy crashing. And he proceeds to bring in the smartest people, the most, you know, orthodox. And I sort of, I I, I go over a lot of the 
the way the pundit corps loved him in 2008 for exactly that reason, for the kind of people he was bringing in. He brought in people who'd won Pulitzer Prizes, people who'd won genius grants. He Not himself by got a city group. Right? Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and then it, they were all, they all, they proceeded to just do exactly the same thing that George W. Bush had done with regards to Wall Street banks. So he, remember what I was saying about Galbraith uh, uh, talking about, about Roosevelt, that what made Roosevelt different than Truman is that Roosevelt didn't listen to established experts. Well, Obama did listen to established experts and as a result, he was no different than Bush where it mattered. And you have the, the, the result of, you know, of, of him destroying the, the sort of hope and faith of a generation. I mean, that was a moment where it was really possible to do anything. He had the world in the palm of his hand uh, and really could have remade uh, this country and instead just chose to go down the, you know, status quo, status quo, status quo. And now here comes, um, here comes Biden saying, yeah, we're going to do some more status quo, folks. How's that sound? Well, right now it sounds pretty damn good. But it's, <laughs> the thing is that that, that that missed opportunity, I don't know if we're ever going to see something like that again in our lifetimes. Another, uh, another chance like that. As I, the way I put it in Listen Liberal is we came to the turning point and we missed the turn. Anyhow, but that's, in my mind, that is, that is if, if you had to understand Obama's failings in one sort of argument or one uh, uh, sentence, I would say it's, it's it, because he had the, you know, he could have brought in uh, outsiders and he didn't do that. You know, he listened to established voices and that was his um, Shakespearean flaw. I mean, it, to the end, that was his Shakespearean flaw. He, you know, he was still getting played and tricked by Republicans right until the very end. <laughs> it's just absolutely tragic. Okay, we have time for one more. Okay. Um, um, well, I was just going to say, uh, I, was, I was just going to give some closing remarks and let you, uh, Thomas, give us some last words before we sign off. So I just wanted to remind everyone that uh, Thomas Frank's books include What's the Matter with Kansas, Listen Liberal, and his latest book, the people know a uh, brief history of anti-populism. If this discussion interested you, you can go purchase these books and read a lot more. Thank you, Thomas, so much for being with us tonight, sharing your time with us, even past uh, the eight o'clock deadline, which you thought and we went <laughs> 30. But uh, thank you so much. And uh, do you have any closing words you want to leave us with? Any final thoughts? Oh, I would. I mean, this has been a lot of fun, guys. And it, it's... And, and I, and I, you know, going to 830 doesn't matter. It's COVID time. It's not like I got anything else to do. I, I just, you know, I feel bad these days because uh, I would love to be meeting with you guys in person like I used to do in the old days going around the country on, on a book tour. And it's not, it's not possible to do that anymore. And so this is, I guess, the best we can do. But I, I hope you do decide to, um, to pick this up. It'll be, it'll, you, you, you will enjoy it. I really worked on this. Um, for two years and it's the only book of mine ever to have color illustrations yes color illustrations wait wait here's cartoons roosevelt trump william jennings bryan as the devil anyhow you can see a lot of a lot of these cartoons and a lot more on my website on tcfrank.com and you can also sign up for my newsletter then and so you won't miss any of my journalism such as it is <laughs> <laughs> but I look forward to the day when we're all able to do this again in person. And thank you for having me. Thanks, Tom. We look forward to that day too. Thanks again so much for coming. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you to everyone who asked a question. Um, I, we had a lot, a lot of fun. So all right. Uh, that note, everyone we'll have a great time. Bye-bye. It's over. <laughs>